the market moves come as investigators, the whole AI and how it fits the economy. President Trump has made it clear he signed an executive order to block individual U.S. states from enforcing their own regulations on AI. On AI. AI seems to be setting the stage for a change comparable to the Industrial Revolution. The Stanford Digital Economy Lab has published a collection of 21 essays exploring the implications of all of this for the global economy. Eric Brynjolfsson is the director of the lab and professor of Stanford's Institute for Human-Centered AI. Professor, you, now you can help us understand all of this stuff because we are, let's put the markets to one side. The markets will go up, the markets will go down. This is really about the productivity gains, the sea change that's going to take place in economic production. And these articles uh, are, are fascinating in that they, they run the gamut. That's right. We're in the early stages of a really big revolution. I heard you talk about the internet. Uh, that's one benchmark, but I, I think this is gonna be significantly bigger. Um, there are bubble aspects to it, but the core technology is really already beginning to have some productivity effects and over the next three to five years, they're going to be much larger. Okay, what do you expect to happen and how will we witness it? Uh, you know, at the Fed meeting this week, the Fed chair was asked about productivity gains, economic growth, but of course the number of new jobs hadn't gone up. And he said, well, that is part of the reason. We are more productive with fewer, with the same or fewer. Chairman Powell is exactly right. You know, productivity is output divided by input. And so there's two ways you can improve that. You could uh, have the same amount of output with fewer workers, and some of that is happening, or you could have more output with the same amount of workers. And that would be a better way um, that we all become wealthier without having people go out of work. But we're having some of both happen um, as the productivity gains come on. AI is already affecting some specific areas. Uh, coding is one of the big areas that's been affected call centers, parts of sales, and over time it's going to spread to basically every occupation in every industry. How did you choose who and how to write these, uh, the, the, these papers? You've got the former Google CEO, Eric Schmidt. You've got Anthropics Chief of Staff, Avital Balbert. You've got MIT's Labor Economist. It's a, you know, um, a wide range of authors. Uh, some of the, uh, dare I say it, some of the, uh, the papers are more esoteric than others, not to say not important. But how did you decide on the range? Well, I got together with my, my co-editors, uh, Ajay Agarwal, Anton Koronek, Daniel Suskind, uh, Sandy Pentland, and we, we thought about who is our wish list. We kind of made like an A team of who we wanted, B team and C team, and I was amazed. We didn't have to get past the A team. Uh, these were the people who are the top technologists, policymakers, economists, um, who all contributed to this. This is actually our second volume. The last one we focused more on AI and democracy. We also had a dream team for that. And this one is focused on what we're calling transformative AI and the economic implications of that. And it was very gratifying. We had our launch event right. yesterday um, and they, they all came here to talk about their papers. Um, and then this this book, I, I encourage people to go pick it up. It's um, uh, available at Amazon elsewhere. It's got the 21 essays. And what separates this from some of the other work is is they're not just the the explaining what's happening, but they're also a whole sets of policy implications about what we can do to help make the transition more effective. As you look at the um, uh, the way forward now, where do you think we are in the revolution? The AI, I, you know, it, 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 it's an inherently stupid question because we won't know where we are until we've actually got there and been and we can look back. But it, just from experience of these sort of technological advancements. Yeah, I, I, it's a really important question and it, it's hard to know for sure. But I've heard you mention earlier some of the canaries in the coal mine that are giving us clues about where we're going. And what we're seeing right now is what I call the early part of the productivity J curve. It often looks kind of like a J, where initially even the most powerful technologies, in fact, especially the most powerful technologies like electricity, the steam engine, early computers, they often have this lull period where not much seems to be happening or even productivity is hurt a bit mm. before it really takes off. With electricity, it took uh, over a decade, a couple of decades for that to happen. 
It's much more compressed this time, but we're still in that early part of the J curve where people are kind of figuring out how to use the technology effectively. And uh, it, within a few years, we'll start seeing the, the upward swing. You call it the digitalist papers, um, which, which is an interesting title. I, you know, I, I immediately think of the federalist papers uh, the, 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 from, from the, the, the previous. I'm, I'm glad you do. It started with a conversation I had with uh, Frank McCourt, and we were talking about how the Federalist Papers, you know, they were born of a period of tremendous change as well. You know, the Industrial Revolution was just gathering steam, you know, literally, and changing the way the economy worked. And meanwhile, this eclectic group of thinkers were trying to lay the foundation for right. a new kind of democracy, a new kind of society. And we sort of, in homage to that, uh, originally we called it the Digital Federalist Papers, but we decided to save a few but, bits and but, just call it the Digitalist Papers. Right, but, but the, the, the Federalist Papers have, a, as their core, a debate debate about the, 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 the way in which this should be done, the strains and the possibilities, uh, the opportunities, but also the risks and worries. They didn't all agree in the Federalist Papers, which is the hallmark of why they are so brilliant. Yes, and, and that's very much the case with this volume. We have a number of different perspectives. We intentionally got some things. I wish you could have been there yesterday for the debates. At times it got heated. I thought some of the panelists were going to break out into a, a fist fight because people sometimes have some very different perspectives. And we don't mean to have like a singular roadmap that this is what you have to do. Yeah. What we're doing is laying out some of the possibilities. And the reality is, is that we're at a turning point right now where there are a lot of different possibilities in front of us. There's no one inevitable future. So we want to lay out some of those possibilities. Some of them involve more concentration of wealth and power. Sure. Some of them involve right. more widely shared prosperity. And, and, you know, we have some choices to make. Professor, we'll talk more and we'll talk more with you as this progresses. Thank you, sir, for joining us.